hey, this is Dennis. I am going to show that SpaceX API. You can see we're up to V4. They've been changing it over time. Um, and I'm going to use the autonomous rest connector user interface to sample three of these different endpoints and actually build a JDBC driver from that and then <clears throat> turn around and use it in a, a couple of different tools. Um, so the way the autonomous rest connector UI works is right now it is a, a JDBC driver, but I, I invoke it just by double clicking on the jar file and it will open it up in a, a browser window for me. And I'm just gonna give it a project name. And I'm going to give it the base URL. Um, this is actually useful, especially if you have a, an API that maybe you want to go through development, through QA, through production, and the base URL will be different. This is just the way where you're able to set it up the configuration file and just reuse it um, for all the different environments. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, grab the base URL and paste it in. And I'm gonna go ahead and save it. And now I'm really ready to start um, um, sampling some of those different endpoints we looked at. So I'm gonna grab launches first. Um, I'm actually gonna pull three of them and um, so launches, and I'm just going to say, um, I'm just going to use a query parameter, just saying pagination is false. Um, and I'm just going to call the table name that is going to be generated launches. And if I go ahead and um, send this, he's going to go ahead and hit the endpoint and bring back the data. And he'll show it in a SQL view first. But if I wanted to, I can look at the JSON data that came back. This is actually, um, the autonomous rest connector has a SQL engine, which will parse SQL and turn around and create the appropriate um, rest request. Um, as Ken showed you, sometimes when we sample one endpoint, depending upon the complexity of it, we may end up with multiple different virtual tables. And in this case, we can see that launches actually has a bunch is a fairly complex uh, payload coming back. So we're going to normalize that out into separate virtual tables. We'll build the foreign key relationships between those two and between the different tables. And this really makes it a lot easier to use it with a tool that is used to uh, dealing with a relational database of rows and columns. So the other thing is I, I didn't show you is this is actually a fairly simple authentication um, with none. But we'll also support um, we'll support basic auth, we'll support uh, URL parameters, um, even OAuth too. Um, so again, this is a real simple one. But if I wanted to, um, pretty much anything that you'll you'll run up against, we're, we're uh, the ideas that we'll be able to support it for you. Um, I actually put a query parameter in that uh, sampling process, and you can see it picked that up as a potential filter um, parameter. So if I send something in specifying pagination with a different value, he would be able to go ahead and push that down. Um, so um, let's go ahead and um, go ahead and add another endpoint for this. So I'm going to grab another one. And I'm going to grab launch pads. And if I do that, I'm just going to give it a name and go ahead and send it out. And you can see, again, he went out to get launch pads. And I've got a few different endpoints uh, in addition to the ones I already had. Um, in this case, I've got a, <clears throat> a table called launches underneath it. And maybe I'm going to find that to be confusing. So if I wanted to, I can change the table name. And maybe instead of launches, I'm just going to call it launch pads underscore launches just to know where it's actually tied to. It just makes it easier for me. And if I wanted to, I could do things like um, go ahead and, and grab um, in the launch pads, for example, I can go ahead and, and determine which 
or specify which of these um, column attributes. Like Ken said, I can change those. So I might decide, you know, ID is actually a primary key and potentially a filter parameter. So I can go ahead and save that information. And if I wanted to, um, this particular endpoint, if we look at it, um, you can see I can grab all of the launches, launch pads, just with a simple get. But if I wanted to, I could also specify a single one by passing an ID parameter of a specific launch pad. So I can tell ARC or the Autonomous REST Connector, I can tell it I've actually got a parameterized path. So in addition to maybe just, if they don't give me an ID, I'm gonna get the list of all of them, but I may want to just focus on one. And to do that, I just would specify a filter parameter here that's part of the, the parameterized path that if they give me an ID, if that's passed in, you know, select asterisk from launch pads where ID is a value, rather than doing a generic select for everything, I'm going to uh, specify and just get one particular one. So that's gonna help with performance. Um, so any anytime that a REST API supports filters, we're going to do our best to take advantage of them and push the filters down. In this way, uh, the performance will be best, the, the amount of data going over the network will be minimized. But in some cases, if you're using a tool, for example, say a Tableau, it's gonna generate queries that are probably gonna be beyond what the REST endpoint can support. So in this case, we'll push down the filters we can, but we'll augment the capabilities of that REST API with our own SQL engine. So if there's uh, you know, post-processing filtering to be done, we can take care of it ourselves in the Autonomous REST Connector. So I'm just gonna go ahead and grab one more endpoint and I'll grab Rockets. And I'll just call it Rockets. Um, another thing to point out, these are all gets, but it's, it's not uncommon to support a post. Um, this would not be a post to actually do an update. Autonomous REST Connector is, is select only, but this is a, there are many REST APIs where the filters um, are actually in a post body and we're able to support that. So I can go ahead and send that down and you can see I, I see data back and if I wanted to look at the JSON, I can do that. Um, another thing I didn't mention is we support different pagination scenarios. Um, a very common one is row offset, where we might want to uh, request the maximum page size uh, that's available and um, basically tell it um, the offset parameter is this one and um, start at offset zero and, and keep uh, traversing, uh, keep sending different REST requests down um, until we get all the data. Um, so pagination is supported, uh, row offset, page number, and also next page token. So I, I can do that. And when I'm done, and I'm just gonna grab these three, um, I can just download my REST configuration file. This is that file um, you know, Ken was talking about. Um, before I get out of here, let me just show you an entity relationship diagram, just because you know, um, we, we, uh, we actually sampled three different endpoints, but you can see we end up with a lot more tables just because of the complexity of data. Um, and this is just a way to help you, um, you know, just see what was done here. Um, so um, this is something I find useful. The other thing is, um, you know, Ken talked about generating the uh, JDBC URL. So another nice thing I like about it is in addition to the mapping and sampling process, I can go ahead and just uh, build the JDBC um, connection URL. And I can do things like, uh, for example, if I want to look at performance, um, you know, we have parameters. And, and in here, you can see we have um, built-in help, online help, which is also real useful. Something like read ahead, if I have pagination where I might be able to have multiple threads requesting data to um, greatly speed performance. And, you know, again, it's only pagination in, in cases where we can go ahead and divide the workload up. But you can just see these things are all here. 
Uh, if I want to, I can turn on some debugging records or debug record here where I can get some useful information where I can see the SQL that came in, I can see the REST request that was generated, I can see the HTTP response code that came back. So it's really useful, as, especially as you're getting started with mapping um, a UR with, a, with a REST request. So let's just look at um, what was generated here. Um, so here's the file um, that was just created, and I'm just gonna open it up in a text editor. So this is kind of what happened kind of under the covers. It, it's built this information for me from the sampling where it grabs the column names, it grabs the data types. Prior to the um, autonomous rest connector user interface, you would have to do the sampling process and then go ahead and um, do hand edit this file. So the, the idea with the autonomous rest connector is we're trying to make it easier and uh, kind of, you know, people talk about democratizing data, making it easier for the, the end users who need to get access to the data and, and do things with it, make it easier for them. So really at this point, I can just grab this information and plug it into a, a JDBC URL. Um, and I've got one over here, I'm, I'm just using Squirrel SQL. And really, if we look at it in, in an editor, basically here is, um, is my JDBC URL, and I think I have it over here just to look at. So you can just see, I'm just doing a connection to the autonomous rest connector, and I've created a uh, data set with that information we just looked at before um, that with the autonomous rest connector rest config file. And the only other thing is I turned on debug recording just because I find it useful to be able to see what was happening. So, you know, if I go back to Squirrel and, um, you know, I've already got a connection here. You can see this is one where I actually mapped uh, all the different endpoints in that um, in the SpaceX. So you can see what it looks like. There's launches. Um, you know, you can see you know the row counts, information about the columns. You can see the primary key. You can see uh, the information we export for foreign keys. And I can turn around and execute some fairly you know complex SQL against it. So I've got. One here, these are just things I actually found generated in um, Tableau, um, you know, so if I, if I run that, we can see um, what comes back from that. And uh, you can see we're doing, in this case, just a single join. This one over here, we're actually doing a three-way join. Um, and, you know, the last thing I want to show you is um, I built a, um, uh, a workbook in Tableau using this data source. Um, so if we look at it, I'm, I'm mapping those tables we looked at before the, the three, and we can see the information as far as the relationship. Um, so Tableau is actually able to do a join between the different, um, different REST endpoints that we've mapped. And I can come over here and um, I just have information about the launch pad. So if we, you know, we look, we can see latitude, longitude, the status, whether it's you know, still in use, the number of launches, and this is all information coming from that uh, REST API. And um, so for example, then I can drill down and look at it. I can see, you know, this is the, uh, the one in the Southwest Pacific, and we can see just information about um, these things. So this was actually a failure. Um, and if I click it, I'm actually gonna jump into Wikipedia and just see some more information about it. But the, the takeaway is really, we're just making it um, a REST request. We're making it look and appear, you know, as if it was just another um, relational database. Um, and so things like Tableau, where it would have problems, you know, with these different endpoints, uh, it just makes it where it's just like another database and all of the capabilities built into it um, we're, we're good to go with it.